Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Okay. Um, today, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Wabin Liu. Dr. Wabin Liu is Vice President and Special Assistant to the Chairman of the BGI Group. Um, with special responsibilities on two of our key pillars um, in the BGI research field, uh, population genomics and the topic of today in particular, spatial transcriptomics. Uh, I'll just hand over to Wei Bin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard, for the kind of introduction and uh, also, first of all, um, thank you all for coming today. Today, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, today, the topic of my talk is large field of view, high resolution, spatially resolved transcriptomics using DNA nanoball patterned arrays. Uh, more specifically, the agenda for today, I'll first start by giving all of you um, a little background into, uh, in, into the technology itself. Um, the inspiration for it, uh, how we developed it, uh, and then I'll go into how we validated the technology, um, as well as then how we uh, used uh, the technology to apply it to solving, um, to, to answering important biological and clinical questions. Uh, and afterwards, I'll also spend um, the second part of my talk going into what we're doing with the technology now to make further improvements on it to make it more useful for the research research community. Some of the exciting things that are coming out in the coming months and, and next half a year to year. Uh, and then finally, I'll close with um, uh, just some food for thought in terms of the implications for the future of uh, precision medicine. So, Cells uh, are located in very, with very specific spatial contexts, and that context is very important to truly understanding um, biological function and processes. Um, in the hierarchy of biological organization, um, the basic unit uh, are cells, and then they're organized into tissues, uh, which are then organized into organs and organ systems, comprising of the entire organism. And then there's also the temporal uh, aspect uh, from conception all the way through death. How does everything change um, over time? And also what is normal physiology? What is you know, abnormal? What is, uh, uh, what is healthy? What is disease? So a lot of these questions really require um, not only understanding of uh, cellular heterogeneity, but also how they're spatially organized. Um, next. So in the attempt to dissect tissue complexity over the last uh, 40 years or so, a variety of um, technologies have been developed to, uh, to chip away at this. Uh, initially, mostly fish-based technologies um, uh, and, and imaging-based technologies, and increasingly in recent years, more towards uh, unbiased whole transcriptome and sequencing-based technologies. Um, however, there's been um, a lot of limitations and challenges in this field, um, whether with the number of targets that you can get for uh, in situ hybridization based technologies or with um, being able to, you know, co how much of the transcriptome you're able to cover and also um, just how scalable or how fine resolution can you really get? Can you really get down to single cell uh, resolution? And what about the question of multi-omics? Uh, so, so these are some of the challenges that um, that the industry has been tackling over the last 40 years. Next slide. So in 2020, um, in Nature Methods, uh, an issue came out that described uh, spatially resolved transcriptomics as the method of the year for 2020. And it covered the work of a variety of research groups um, working on spatially resolved transcriptomics, including um, profiling some of the work that BGI research uh, was doing to um, to to uh, toward, towards towards that end, uh, which which at the time was basically the um, precursor technology to what is now known as uh, stereo seek, um, th and that, then at that and that's the spatial uh, transcriptomics technology developed by BGI Research, which stands for 
spatial enhanced resolution omics sequencing, so abbreviated StereoSeq. Uh, next. So, you know, go, going back to some of the limitations and challenges that I mentioned earlier about um, resolution and capture area. Uh, so if, if we want to look, study single cell multi-omics with a spatial context, then it would make sense that we ha would have to first be able to get down to single cell or subcellular resolution in order to do so. Um, if we're unable to get down to single cell resolution from a spatial context, then we always have to make do with guesswork and deconvolution techniques and also uh, make do with uh, um, lack of coverage in certain areas. So for example, if you look at 10X uh, Visium technology over here, it has a spot size of uh, 55 microns. Um, the size of a average, the average size of a cell is about 10 microns by 10 microns. So when you have a spot size that's 55 microns, it's covering more than a dozen cells or maybe a couple do dozen cells underneath that spot. Not to mention the center to center resolution is 100 microns, uh, which means that in between the spaces between the spots, you're um, missing a lot of um, signals. So uh, this forces um, reliance on developing algorithms to deconvolute and to just make estimates of um, of uh, of single cell uh, um, 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 uh, omic signals uh, from the spatial context, and then also the capture area is measured in millimeters for these technologies, meaning that it's okay for smaller tissues, like if you're talking about zebrafish or drosophila. But what if you wanted to do um, spatial spatial single cell omics on large tissues? What about profiling, for example? an entire brain atlas, a human brain atlas, or the human heart, or other complex organs, or even larger organisms. Um, so, so the challenge is how do we get, how do we have bigger capture area, but at the same time also be able to get down to true single cell uh, resolution. Next. So the BGI, um, uh, the, the BGI um, uh, uh, answer to this was inspired by our um, uh, our DNB seq technology. So uh, one of our subsidiaries, MGI, which actually went public today this morning uh, on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, um, the the basis for the MGI sequencers for doing massively parallel uh, short read sequencing is using something called DNB seq. So that stands for DNA nanoball sequencing. Um, and for the DNB seq, uh, we do this massively parallel sequencing by having these uh, large area um, silicon wafer chips that are etched with a patterned array of DNA nanoballs. Um, and the size of the nanoballs is 220 nanometers. And they're, they're spaced 500 nanometers apart from each other. So when you have this large gridded array of very, very um, closely spaced uh, and small DNA nanoballs, with each one doing an independent sequencing reaction, uh, then we're able to get tremendous scale and also um, to combine with very good engin uh, engineering breakthroughs, we also have very good affordability. Um, and the, si the size of the largest sequencing chips that we have is up to 13 centimeters by 13 centimeters. So with that kind of large area and with all the na DNA nanoballs, we're able to get a lot of data output out of one um, sequencing sequencing chip. So this inspired us to think, what if we applied this to spatial biology? What if we could take a tissue and put it onto this chip, and then would we be able to overcome some of the limitations that I had just described in the previous slide? So next slide. So that's, that's what we did, and that's what we've been able to accomplish over the last um, two or three years. So we took that large, um, you know, that large capture area and uh, a sequencing chip, and we repurposed it for doing spatial biology. So we, um, we generated the DNA nanoballs on this chip instead with a 25 random base barcode, DNA barcode which we call CID or, or coordinate, coordinate ID. And through rolling circle amplification, generating several hundred copies, we create the DNA nanoballs out of the CID. And each, each DNA nanoball uh, with its own 
um, specific XY coordinate has corresponds to a unique 25 base sequence. So then in step number two, we then sequence all the CID uh, on, on this patterned array and we store this file, um, the sequencing um, data, as a separate file called a mask file. And this mask file um, is basically how you match the 25 base barcodes to all the XY coordinates in space. We then complete the um, manufacture of the StereoSeq chip by also adding a molecular ID, uh, which is 10 random bases uh, attached to the CID in order to help you distinguish between um, whether the whether what you're capturing is if the if the CD if the mRNA if the mRNA sequence is the same are you capturing from the same molecule or are you capturing from two different molecules of the same sequence, and then also we then attach the poly T probe to capture to hybridize with the um, poly A tail of the mRNA. Um, in in future versions, we're also going to have it available with a 6N probe to be able to hybridize with all RNAs, including, um, you know, including non-human non RNAs and also things like non-coding RNAs and uh, micro RNAs. So with this, uh, with this, the stereoseq chip is ready to go. And then we do pre proceed to in situ RNA capture um, by, uh, we currently work with fresh frozen tissues, but uh, as you'll see uh, later on in my presentation, we're also, um, increasing the number of uh, the, 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 the different kinds of uh, tissue preparations that will be compatible to um, for, for the stereoseq workflow. Um, so uh, we take, we, we prepare the tissue, fresh frozen, embedded in OCT, and we slice it down to the plane that we want to do the experiment. And then we generally work with slices of thickness between five microns and 20 microns, depending on you know, the, the type of tissue and the size of the cell. And, uh, but generally we, we stick with about 10 microns thickness. And then after making the slice, we load it onto the, the chip, we fix it, and then we do SSDNA, uh, nucleic acid staining, on the tissue uh, in order to first take an image of the tissue and so we can see where all the nuclei are before we proceed to the permeabilization. So this way we have an image that we can store, which we can use for image registration later to assist with uh, single cell segmentation. So then, after taking the image, we then permeabilize it, uh, which exposes the RNA inside the tissue to the probes, and they hybridize, and we do a reverse transcription to generate the cDNAs, which we wash off, and we prepare for um, uh, uh, library construction for sequencing. And after we finish sequencing, the, 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 the reads that are sequenced um, contain um, the cDNA sequence, contain the UMI it contain the molecular ID sequence and also contain the coordinate ID sequence, which we can then run, put through our bioinformatics pipeline, and then it recreates the 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 the, the spatial the two-dimensional spatial um, uh, image of where all the reads on the chip are located according to corresponding to their CID uh, barcodes. Next. <laughs> So, so you know, Richard over here is going to show all of you, um, you know, kind of the size of the the chips and what we can do with this. So, uh, so going back to so, so we've been able to do this technology across all these different um, size chips, going up to 13 centimeters by 13 centimeters over here. So this would actually be able to fit an entire coronal section of a human brain, um, and just like over here with a seven centimeter by seven centimeter chip size, you can see the monkey semi-brain section. Fits very comfortably onto this. Um, our standard chip size is the, the small one on that, on, that, on that thing that's being passed around right now, which is one square centimeter, which is enough for a lot of research purposes. Um, still has you know, more than 2.4 times capture area compared to uh, you know, 6.5 millimeters by 6.5 millimeters. Um, and you could also embed multiple tissues onto the same chip um, of the same tissue type. Next. So what does this mean? It's, uh, it means that the size of a cell being 10 microns by 10 microns, and now by making that technology work, we're able to get down to nanoscale resolution. 500 nanometers resolution, that's for 10 microns by 10 microns, that's equivalent to 20 spots by 20 spots, or 400 DMBs um, within the area of 
of each cell. And with each of these DNBs being able to capture multiple reads, multiple transcripts. So in these two important um, um, in these two important aspects, we significantly uh, outperform existing technologies. Next. So after having this exciting um, breakthrough, we wanted to validate this technology. So we first went to a well-studied tissue, the mouse olfactory bulb, uh, and we did two sections of the mouse olfactory bulb, and we then proceeded to doing square bin analysis. Uh, so we did bin analysis um, at bin 50, and for the our resolution, bin 50 means um, you know 25 microns by 25 microns square bins, and then we applied our own uh, our own in-house uh, unsupervised spatially constrained clustering technique, which is basically an unsupervised clustering technique that also takes into account the the, the spatial uh, you know neighboring information to get better clustering results. And we're able to see the different layers within the uh, mouse olfactory bulb. And next, we looked at the R mRNA capture efficiency. So we went down to the 10 micron square bin. So we went down to 10 micron square bin, and we're able to see uh, 1,450 transcripts per 10 micron square bin, which is roughly the equivalent size of a cell, and corresponding about five or 600 genes. Uh, in that 10 micron bin. And then also we see good re reproducibility between the two sections. Next. Then we want to see, uh, you know, how, uh, how does the number of uh, transcripts that we capture compare to other technologies at different resolutions? We looked at the two micron bin, the 10 micron bin, and the 100 micron bin. And we see that in each of these different capture areas, we significantly outperform other technologies and the number of transcripts that we capture. And then we, want, we wondered uh, how accurately does uh, StereoSeq also recreate the spatial lo uh, locations of where we would expect uh, example genes to be. So we went to the um, Allen Brain Atlas in situ hybridization database, and we looked at two example genes, PCP4 and SLC17A7. And then we see that compared to the in situ hybridization data that for StereoSeq section one, section two, that we recreate the spatial locations of where you expect to see these genes being expressed uh, with very high resolution compared to other technologies. Next. And of course, uh, very importantly, because we're able to get down to 500 nanometer uh, resolution, um, and that's uh, very much subcellular, so uh, we should be able to get very good uh, single cell segmentation uh, using this data. Um, so we then proceeded to studying this uh, with a mouse um, mouse brain. We took a coronal section of the mouse hemibrain, and then we so over here in blue you see the nucleic acid stained image, and in green you see the image created just from the detected DNB. Um, so uh, and then and then when you zoom in on just the um, the recreated spatial locations of all the reads, you see that just off of the detected DNB alone. Uh, you can actually see from the very good data sets that you can actually see where the nuclei and the nuclei of each cell is, is is approximately located. You see the spots, which is where individual cellular nuclei are. Um, and then when you zoom in, uh, you also see very clearly that you know um, you could also register the nucleic acid stained image of where the nuclei are from the staining, and then get even more accurate. Um, um, estimates of, uh, of the cell bins. And then so you're able to circle the different um, areas of uh, where, where the cells are and then also assign all the transcripts um, in the, in, uh, from, 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 the, from the data to, to their uh, respective cells. Uh, so this, um, this, this, shows, uh, this shows the, 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 um, the how, 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 our, how our high resolution is able to truly get down to single cell segmentation. So then we went to, uh, we did bin 50 analysis on the same um, tissue slice again, and uh, we were able to identify the different uh, anatomic regions um, of the mouse hemibrain. And then when we do image-based cell segmentation off of the different anatomic regions in here, uh, we're able to get a total of about 50 to 60,000 single cells for this one uh, mouse hemibrain slice, 
and we're able to uh, do, do cell clustering to identify all the different cell types color coded over here. And when you zoom in at these different areas, you can see the beautiful uh, cellular heterogeneity and spatial organization. Next. Also, uh, diffusion is an important thing to consider as well. So we, because uh, after you permeabilize, it also opens up these, um, you know, the, 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 the transcripts to both lateral and uh, vertical diffusion. So um, we looked at um, the diffusion profile and we see that by comparing the mitochondrial RNA um, um, and nuclear RNA uh, diffusion distances, we see that the diffusion is at approximately at, at an average of 6.84 microns compared to SM fish, which is 5.32. So a little bit worse than SM fish. Um, but we're also making uh, tremendous improvements to this. Uh, so I'll be going over um, some of the work we've been doing recently to using PFA treated uh, pre treated samples, which we've been able to show that we're able to get um, diffusion distances of comparable to SM fish or even better. So we validate the technology, and next we decide to apply StereoSeq to. Um, answer some biological questions. So uh, we did a variety of uh, different um, projects at the same time, but the first and most important of which we did was the um, uh, applying stereoseq to unlocking the black box of cell organization during mouse embryonic development. So we um, applied stereoseq to the developing mouse embryo um, from days 9.5 through 16.5 at one day intervals. And so we, we did, um, we took, you know, all these, uh, these one day time points from 9.5 to 16.5 days and we generated a total of 53 sagittal sections. Um, and we applied stereoseq and we first did bin 50 analysis, square bin analysis, and we we're able to see, identify all the different tissue regions color coded over here, um, all the different tissues. And then we we're able to recreate, accurately recreate the, de the developmental trajectory um, of these tissues across this time span. And then when we do a round of reclustering or deeper clustering, still using bin 50, um, with, within each of these different tissue regions, we're able to uh, see very clearly the tissue subregions, um, the anatomical subregions within these tissues in the brain, in the brain and the spinal cord. And also, for example, in the kidney, we're also able to see the microstructures. And next, we also wanted to see, uh, you know, how does the um, stereoseq data assist with understanding um, the functional information in the tissues? So we, uh, we, 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 we went to the hotspot algorithm, which looks at non-random variation in gene expression. And we were able to identify through hotspot uh, multiple gene modules and where they're spatially located and what tissues they're associated with. And then by applying the algorithm scenic, uh, used in um, single cell RNA sequencing for uh, studying co-expressed uh, genes and their and their uh, transcription factors to identify regulons. We applied scenic um, and also hotspot together in order to see uh, identify uh, almost 500 different regulons and also um, where, where their modules are located. Next, we went to the um, day 16.5 mouse embryo which is the most um, fully patterned one, most complicated. And we, we did image-based um, cell segmentation uh, on this slice to be able to identify um, more, almost 300,000 single cells that you can see when you zoom in. These are all the segmented cells. Um, and through, and through, with these cells, we were able to do cell clustering to identify all the uh, major cell types and also where they map to in space. And when you do um, deeper clustering, uh, reclustering with um, cellular clustering, we're able to see the subtypes, for example, with epithelial cells and chondrocytes and uh, all the different subtypes um, that you can get in the UMAP and also where they map to in space. Um, and also we've been able to um, uh, apply very interesting algorithms like Dynamo developed at MIT um, to look at RNA velocity with uh, stereoseq data because stereoseq um, captures both intronic, intronic reads and exonic reads. 
So if you think about you know the transcription process and translation process that starts with um, raw transcripts have introns and then they're spliced out to form mature transcripts and then they're translated and then degraded. Um, if you look at the changing proportion of, uh, of, of uh, changing percentages of uh, uh, intron reads and exon reads, you're actually able to see um, in progenitor cells in the brain, for example, over here, um, the directionality that new cell types, cell, new cell types are being formed, the, the, the directionality of differentiation uh, and how these different layers, uh, the vectors um, uh, for, for, what, for how these uh, different layers are being uh, created. And populated. Next. And then we also explored cell fate dynamics. Um, so we went to, we zoomed in on the dorsal midbrain of the, of the mouse embryo, and we did um, image based cell segmentation and cell clustering. And then we looked at the cells over here. So you see the radioglia cells, which are the progenitor cells, to two different cell fates to one to neuroblasts and the other to glioblasts. And we looked at three different time points, days 12.5, 14.5, and 16.5. And we see on day 12.5 that the progenitor cells are pretty much um, the only thing, the only ones that are found and evenly spread throughout. By day 14.5, the progenitor cells are only found in the caudal region. And then you see different pockets where they've differentiated into either um, glioblasts or neuroblasts. And day 16.5, that differentiation um, dynamic is even, even, more, e e e even, even more clear. And also, um, with the information that we get from StereoSeq, um, for these two different cell fates, the RGC to glioblast and RGC to neuroblast, we're also able to see all the differentially expressed genes and the ligands. And lastly, we, um, for, for this particular paper, we also wondered whether we could use the mouse StereoSeq data as a potential model to better understand human developmental disorders. So we went to the developmental disorder genotype to phenotype database um, of uh, human GWAS uh, SNPs um, associated with developmental disorders. And we took 1,959 of those SNPs um, corresponding to different disorders and we uh, mapped them onto the mouse stereoseq data across all the different time points. And we can see um, when and where and for how long are, they, um, are, are these different SNPs being expressed for um, corresponding to a variety of different uh, disorders, and we focus specifically on Robin Al syndrome, um, which is uh, which has the phenotypes of cleft lip, cleft palate, and limb deformities, and which uh, Wind 5A is implicated in, and so is its uh, uh, so is a homeo homeobox gene MSX1. Um, so when we map it onto the stereoseq data, we see that um, Wind 5A and MSX1 are both. Um, are both localized in the areas where you would expect to see the human phenotypes in the maxilla and the limb for the mouse. And more importantly, you can also see um, what cell types are expressing these different, um, um, these different genes. So for example, in the maxilla area, there's uh, two, it's expressed in mesenchymal cells and fibroblasts, whereas in the limb, it's only in mesenchymal cells. So you, you, you go from just having association uh, data um, and, and, and to actually be able to see where they map to in space and what cell types are expressing them. And this gives you a very good start in, in better understanding how these um, disorders actually actually occur. So we, so we did um, you know, similar um, science on other uh, 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 mo uh, model organisms, so including zebrafish embryogenesis, and also Drosophila embryo and larvae development. So we, so we, we for this we also did um, recreate three D three dimensional um, models of the Drosophila embryo um, by taking uh, multiple slices um, uh, on the z axis as well. And then also we apply it to plants. So for plant cells, um, they have cell walls, which makes single cell sequencing um, somewhat difficult and uh, so, but, what, but for stereoseq, that's a big advantage because when we take a slice of the plant tissue, you know, if we stain the cell walls, then you get very, very accurate uh, cell segmentation. So we call this a uh, single cell stereoseq, SC stereoseq. Um, and we did this on the Arabidopsis. And uh, all of you might have noticed um, that, you know, just a few days ago, 
um, that there was a science paper um, with the axolotl on the cover. And this is our latest cover paper in science with a uh, stereo seek um, where we applied this to um, where we applied this to studying uh, regeneration in the axolotl brain. So axolotl has tremendous regenerative ca uh, capacity uh, for any of its tissues. So even if we make a lesion in its brain, it can actually grow back. So you know, how does this amazing process um, occur? So we applied stereoseq to, to studying this um, regrowth process in the, in, in the brain. And we were able to, through, through stereoseq, we were able to um, get down to single cell resolution and also be able to um, identify a, um, a pocket of cells that at the site of injury that became induced progenitor cells um, to, and also cells that actually revert to immature uh, neuronal states as well as identify cell state transitions that occur in the regrowth process that are very, that, that are very similar to um, early embryonic uh, neurogenesis. Uh, so this is an, another example, yet another example of the power of stereoseq and how it has been used to understand biology. And of course, the, the applications in, um, in, in digital pathology and oncology are enormous. Uh, for this particular paper, we looked at, which, which is in bioarchive right now, um, and we're still working on it, but it's, uh, we looked at the tumor microenvironment at the invasive front of a solid tumor. And what's amazing about stereoseq is that unlike traditional pathology, where you just look at morphology through H and D staining, stereoseq with its subcellular resolution um, and, and with the number of genes and uh, UMI that you can get, you can actually annotate all the where all the stromal cells are, uh, where all the uh, immune cells are, where all the cancer cells are, and also specifically what cell types and cell states, and how, how are they changing, and, how, and what is their interplay in these complex uh, uh, microenvironments. So when we look at the invasive front of a solid tumor, you can see at the margins what's happening you know, with, the, with this uh, interplay, and how are certain signatures actually promoting tumor growth, or how are certain signatures actually helping to inhibit them, uh, which, uh, which opens up, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of new directions to pursue, um, you know, in, in every, in the entire process of understanding, um, you know, how do cancer cells form in the first place, tumorigenesis, how do, how do they go from benign to malignant, um, at what stage do they metastasize and how do they choose where to metastasize and why do they metastasize there and not somewhere else, uh, and, um, and, and also exploring questions like um, what kinds of signatures are associated with better prognosis, worse prognosis, with recurrence, uh, with, um, with, better, um, um, with better outcomes with, uh, with immunotherapy or worse outcomes. And when you, uh, when you encounter things like immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy resistance, why, why and how do those uh, resistance mechanisms occur and how do you overcome them? Um, so this is, this is I, the answers to all those questions can be answered um, with spatial precision medicine uh, when you get down to this kind of resolution and when you incorporate, um, uh, we're able to do multi-omics and better analysis with it as well. Um, so this is, uh, and, then, and, and, and of course also studying things like um, um, tertiary lymphoid structures and, um, and also being able to apply um, a lot of, uh, you know, um, applying algorithms like cell phone DB um, with the stereoseq data to look at spatial cell cell interactions. So all of this, um, we, uh, we, we published in, um, uh, in a series of papers in cell and, development, and, and developmental cell in early May, um, cover papers, uh, uh, four of them, uh, and, and, and also the, the axolotl paper, and we also released a bunch of uh, pre-printed bioarchive papers, one of which is the axolotl paper that's now the science paper, and we have a bunch more coming. And so these, we, um, the, the, uh, with these res exciting new results um, in the field of spatial temporal omics, we contributed the results to a new, to creating a new consortium. So this consortium is called the Spatial Temporal Omics Consortium, and it's basically an open collaborative research initiative um, established to, you know, specifically focusing on spatial temporal omics. You could think of it as kind of like a human cell atlas, but with a lot more of a spatial temporal omics focus. And um, 
and we have a bunch of uh, collaborations around the world with some of the top scientists. Um, and so by with these initial publications, we use them to um, to to basically uh, open to 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 create this new consortium where we want to unite all the different stakeholders, all the scientific minds, all the software engineers, all the mathematicians, all the industry partners, all the funders in order to work together to um, to 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 go after four major um, uh, four major uh, categories that pretty much cover the entire span of biology. So physiology, development and aging, uh, disease and evolution. Um, so right now the consortium is has only been um, created for a few months and we're really uh, it's more and more people joining. It's all open and it's um, not limited to anyone and it's, and it's industry agnostic. And um, right now the organizing committee is just being created and getting organized itself. So the organizing committee is organizing itself to kind of further define the, um, the, the more specific, more specifically define the mission and vision as well as, um, you know, whether it would write a white paper and also um, what kinds of, uh, sh sh how can we create a new um, like data um, uh, or information reference um, in, in order to, um, to to unite all the work being done in spatial temporal omics and single cell biology so that all the output can be measured across a common benchmark um, to help move the field forward. Next. So that said, um, um, so what's next for stereoseq itself as a technology? So, um, you know, in the process of um, doing the science and working with all our collaborators from around the world, we've been able to um, gather, uh, get a very good understanding of kind of what everyone um, hopes to be able to do with this technology next. So we've been, um, so we're, so we have a wish list for how we will continue to improve this technology right now. So um, we want to make it more compatible with uh, sample types, especially FFP, um, which is a challenge, but uh, we're, we're making tremendous progress with that. We want to be able to um, do multi-omics on the same slide and also be compatible to do uh, HND staining, immunofluorescence, and all that on the same tissue slide. And also, uh, of course, data processing is very important because this is a sequencing-based technology, unbiased whole transcriptome in C2, um, and so it generates a lot of data. And and with especially with multi-omics, and as we get better at uh, capture efficiency, um, then we really need fast data processing, and we also need um, more easy to use. Um, workflows for cell segmentation and also for 3D reconstruction to recreate these uh, three-dimensional atlases. And so we call this uh, StereoSeq V2 and also StereoPy is our Python-based toolkit. So, and we'll call that StereoPy V1. And so most of our work in improving this technology are focused on biochemistry improvements and also improvements on the algorithm in order to accomplish the um, the algorithms in order to accomplish the uh, the VPNs that I just uh, said in the previous slide. Next. <coughs> so going into more detail about some of our, you know, ongoing R&D and improvements for Stereo CV2 and Stereo PyV1. Um, first, uh, we found that using PFA pre-treated samples, um, we get much better diffusion profile. Um, so for example, with the testicular tissue here, you see that for the nucleic acid stained image here, the morphology of the testicular tissue, uh, when we do the DMB data, you see that in some of the some areas there's diffusion of the transcripts into the seminal tubules. So we found that if we do PFA pretreated testicles with the uh, morphology that you see from nucleic acid staining over here versus the DMB image, it's much more closely matched and there's much better diffusion. Uh, th th there's much less diffusion. That's apparent. Next. We did this across multiple tissue types and not only do we see the same improvements in diffusion for every tissue type, but we also see improved gene counts and MID counts. Good improvements for across all these tissue types. Better capture, better capture efficiency. And then for FFP work, we also see that just off the DMB image alone, we have enough RNA that's visually aggregated to enable 
cell segmentation just by RNA abundance alone. And we're making tremendous uh, headway in making this um, um, in making this um, a reality very soon. And also um, our chips, because it's silicon based, so they're not transparent. So it's been a challenge previously to be able to do HND staining and transcriptomics on the same slide. Um, so we currently have been working with um, uh, HND staining of adjacent slices, but for V2, we'll be able to do it on the same slice. And then also um, combining immunofluorescence and transcriptomics for more richer information um, of, of different tissue types. So we'll also have immunofluorescence available in the workflow so that we can um, include, for example, the blocking steps and the incubation of the antibody, and then we can do the IF imaging, and then we can do the SSDNA staining and do the nucleic acid uh, stain image as well, and then we proceed to the transcriptomics workflow. And then by combining the SSDNA um, and the transcriptomics and the IF images, we can um, do, we can look at things like, for example, looking at the tumor microenvironment and doing IF staining of KI67, the cell, prolifer the cell proliferation marker associated with cancer cells. And then we can see where all the cancer cells are through IF staining first. And then we can subtract the spatial locations of the cancer cells. And with the remaining non-cancer cells, we can do use the transcriptomics in order to um, annotate the stromal cell types and also the immune cell types. For example, where the fibroblasts are and where the dend dendritic cells are and also be able to combine with the H&D images on the same slide, as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, for a much richer analysis of the tumor microenvironment. And also um, be able to do proteomics on the same slide. So right now our approach is to use DNA labeled antibodies um, and we can customize these um, antibodies and uh, up to 20 plus protein panels at the same time together with the transcriptomics. And so, for example, um, we can do this with, uh, over here we demonstrated with uh, CD3, CD8, and CD19. And when you merge the images, you can see um, spatially where each of these different um, um, proteins are located um, in, this, in, in, this, uh, in this tissue slide along with the uh, transcriptomics information too. And of course, the workflow, um, everyone wants to be able to do this with less hands-on time, with quicker turnaround time, um, with, uh, with, with more reproducibility. And, and so, so we've, uh, right now, this technology um, is being done mostly manually. So we've, we have the stereo seat chips and we have the entire protocol and it's compatible with, uh, you know, most of the equipment. It's, it's doable with most, most, with the equipment that's available in most labs. Um, um, but requiring also special microscopes in order to make sure that the imaging um, and, and the stitching and everything can, can be accurate enough to do the image registration with the stereoseq spatial data. Um, but it still takes a long time. It's very complicated. So we want to take the steps from permeabilization all the way to through to library construction um, and put it all into this one box that's fully automated end to end to be able to do 24 samples concurrently um, uh, processing at the same time with less than 30 minutes hands-on time and being able to take from the cryostat, the cryostat step all the way through to the visualized result in seven days or less for the turnaround time. So all this is coming next year and we have the prototype already working. And so for the, and also to improve um, the processing speed, we also have um, our Python based toolkit StereoPy is able to have, a, has demonstrated a 10 times improvement in performance in the input and output and data processing compared to other like Surat. And also we're, we'll be focusing on um, improving um, spatial data denoising and pattern, pattern identification as well as uh, improving our own uh, clustering methods, spatial clustering methods um, with, with better resolution. So for example, for bin 20 clustering over here, our method shows significant improvement over latent clustering and also improving space, spatial cell type annotation. So, um, and, and the cell segmentation, um, the image-based cell segmentation workflow, uh, we're also going to uh, make that um, a, a mainstay, a mainstay of the um, 
of the Stereo Pi V1 in order so, so that so that you can go through that entire uh, uh, pipeline um, with, with, through, through through the Stereo Pi. And of course, um, as we um, do more and more of the StereoSeq uh, experiments, it'll also open up a lot of uh, need for making these, uh, recreating these three-dimensional atlases. So 3, 3D reconstruction is very important and we'll have that as part of the workflow too. So the way it works is that we take the, when you make the slice of the tissue, we take a thick picture of the block face and then we have the software that will, um, then that will recreate um, the, 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 the virtual image of the, of, the, of, the, of the tissue that we're working with, and then also be able to assign um, all the StereoSeq uh, data to where it originally corresponded to in that um, three-dimensional reconstruction. So for example, here you see actual real data that we did with, um, with a China, in a China brain science collaboration. And this is the kind of like a crude atlas of the mouse hemibrain where we took um, 117 coronal slices, um, and then we and then we did stereoseq on them, and we re recreated this uh, hemibrain atlas, um, totaling more than four million individual cells, more than four million single cells, all at 500 nanometer resolution for the data. So, in summary, stereoseq v2 and stereopi v1 will be released in 2023. Um, um, and these are tremendous improvements, and we think that you know, by, by being compatible with FFP, higher, uh, better capture efficiency and higher single cell resolution, and also by high, being, com being able to do h &D staining on the same slide, and also um, immunofluorescence and proteomics, as well as better uh, you know, 3D reconstruction and cell binning, um, all of this is going to open up really exciting new applications um, to really uh, make, make, uh, to, to push this field along even more. So, for example, I want to um, demonstrate what might be possible, and you know what what, uh, what kinds of things we might be inspired to do together, um, everywhere in the world uh, using this uh, exciting new field. So, in China, in southwest China, we have a city called Chongqing, um, which has a very big uh, pathology institution there called JFL. So, we created recently a JFL BGI stomics center in China, and so. Um, this is China Speed. It was an empty location on uh, April 1st. By June 25th, there's an opening ceremony <laughs> installing all the stereoseq, uh, you know, uh, laboratory capabilities, including the sequencing and everything. But what? But what is this partnership exactly? So basically, they have um, they have uh, tremendous pathology capability and access to samples and clinicians and and lab space. And we have the technologies, and we also have our scientists, and we also have our R and D team. And so we also have our PhD students, they have their PhD students, we have our postdocs, they have their postdocs, we come together and then we form this center um, with, a, with, with a very clear mission, which is that we really want to uh, focus on the translational potential of this technology into the clinic and into clinical trials and into digital, into revolutionizing digital pathology. So we focus specifically on cancer for this and you know, I mentioned earlier with the invasive fronts of solid tumors, all the exciting potential that you can, um, um, uh, all the exciting uh, potential investigative areas you could do with stereoseq. And so, for example, all these processes of tumor genesis, of recurrence and metastasis, and therapy resistance, and uh, how do you overcome the resistance? How do you get better outcomes through true precision medicine? Um, all this we want to work together through Stereoseq to create a series of um, publications um, and, and, and in the next few years and generate IP together and also put all that into a knowledge base combined with AI algorithms and uh, be able to redefine the way that we understand the disease and also see how we can get into clinical trials. So, you know, in the 19th century, um, we were studying disease through cellular pathology. And we made a lot of improvements in the 21st century um, into molecular pathology. And then with all the improvements that you see with um, spatial biology recently, including stereoseq and of course, even more so in stereoseq V2, um, we'll be able to do true spatial precision medicine from this year onwards by combining all these different multi-omics and 
and all the, the, the um, getting down subcellular resolution across large capture areas and 3D reconstruction to truly understand the spatial signatures to get down to true precision, true precision medicine and personalized treatments away from just, um, you know, GWAS. And so I also want to take the opportunity to um, share with all of you in case you might have missed it since we, um, you know, so, so, so just a couple of days ago, we had um, ICG, in, um, BGI holds a conference called International Conference on Genomics every year. ICG in Riga, Latvia, um, they also announced a grant program, a global grant program for, for stomics. So, so, we, so, this is, um, so this is a grant that BGI Research um, made available through the Spatial Temporal Omics Consortium in order to help um, assist accessibility to the technology globally. Um, and so the grant will cons comprise of a total of 50 grants, and each grant has 12 stereoseq, 12 one by one centimeter stereoseq chips for free. And with each one by one centimeter chip, um, also providing 450 uh, gigabytes of sequencing for free. So a total of 5.4 terabytes of sequencing plus 12 one by one um, stereoseq chips. Um, and, and so all you have to do to apply is just scan this and you have to write like an abstract, like 300 to 1,000 words. And then you know, we'll have, we have a review panel at BGI Research uh, and you know the, the application deadline is November 30th and we will get back to you with the winners by December 30th. And last but not least, thank you for coming to this talk. And uh, if you're interested in joining the Spatial Temporal Omics Consortium, there's the QR code. You can scan it, just fill in some information. And then um, as the organizing committee gets organized and you know, comes up with additional updates and community events, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Okay, thank you very much. We have a, maybe one or two minutes for a couple of quick questions, and then um, we've also got some refreshments and a bit of a mix of session outside in the breakout in the uh, tapestry area, if uh, some more questions afterwards. Thanks so much. I don't want to monopolize all the question time, but I had two questions. So the first one is, how soon do you think we'll be able to do things like assigning the T cell receptor sequence to every T cell intersection? Uh, so, so, th so this is a question I get asked pretty much everywhere when I'm dealing with uh, clinicals. So, so we're, we're under the we're under the gun to develop this. Uh, but you know, you know, this um, people people ask about um, you know five prime um, capture and also about being able to you know um, sequence the entire length of the cDNA. So we're working on that right now. I'm not I don't have a specific time timeline, but we we certainly it's one of the top priorities. So hopefully by some time in the next. Uh, half year or so, hopefully we'll have something there. Yeah, well, so we are very interested in long read sequencing from these kinds of platforms, something we spend a lot of time on. Yeah. Here. Um, okay, the other question is really sort of a slightly tricky one. So we're still tied to doing sequencing and sequencing is expensive, right? And in fact, the cost of sequencing has got nothing to do with our capability to do this stuff. So how are you going to make sequencing cheap enough that this will be possible for everybody so okay so 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 that's that's actually um one of the advantages of working with us at bgi because uh we we're not dependent on others for the sequencing and we've been able to um some of the some of the largest population genomics programs in the world are using our dmv seq platforms right now uh, and as you go from as you as you go to our really large scale sequencers the the cost is dramatically lower and much lower than what you would get out of uh, Illumina sequencing. So actually with the increases, of, with the decrease in cost of sequencing and also sequen MGI sequencing also be a, being a part of BGI, is actually a tremendous advantage to enable you to uh, not have to worry about sequencing. I'm, I'm thinking about this kind of like, it's kind of like the days when we used to have like one or two megabytes of storage space for emails and then Gmail comes out and there are gigabytes and stuff and we eventually we don't have to care about whether we or so hopefully that's kind of where the where the where, where everything is going. But also another way to address this um, question is um, um, so it's it's for the for this amount of sequencing. Yeah, I think it's 
StereoSeq has a tremendous advantage in looking at unfamiliar tissues and for doing discovery work, but you also don't have to always do you know, whole transcriptome every time. Sometimes there's also combinations with targeted approaches uh, depending on the situation. And also, we also see that that's an important need. So we'll also be, um, we'll, we'll be thinking about developing uh, targeted um, solutions together with this uh, whole unbiased approach as well. So hopefully with a combination of all these things, I think it will be much more accessible. Um, you sort of alluded to it in your last slide with the multiple types of seeks on the one bit of tissue. Uh, going to the multiomics question, can you do genome plus RNA seq on the same region, or do you have thoughts about doing that? For example, cancer mutations plus the transcriptome of the cell that's not inferred through the actual cDNAs, but it's, you know, yeah, uh, there, there, there's no reason why we can't. I think that you know that's certainly something that we need to we need to work on. So as you can see, a lot of the work we've done with stereoseq so far has been in general, more general, a, a variety of different fields in academic research. But I think especially as we start getting more into the translational um, stuff and the clinical stuff, I think uh, applications like these are the ones that we're really prioritizing, the genome and also um, everything to do with better understanding of immunology. OK. Um. So I'm sorry, we only have the room for an hour. So the next bit of what we're doing is going to be out amongst the refreshments. Um, so that's Kira doing some kind of uh, talk about their workflow, I think. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you.